shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. This morning, let's take our Bibles and turn in the New Testament to the book of 1 Thessalonians, Paul's epistle to the Thessalonian church, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the Christian's attitude. Paul here reveals six vital aspects of the Christian's attitude, what we should have as uh, an attitude as believers. First of all, we are to be watchful because the Lord is coming respectful, because our leaders deserve, or if they don't deserve it, they need it. Uh, mindful, we are mindful because others need that. We are thankful because our thanksgiving blesses everybody. And we're attentive because God is speaking, and we're faithful because consistency is necessary. It's vital for our holiness. So the lesson, I think, for this chapter might well be proper attitude determines proper outcome. And as always, Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for this precious word. Prepare our hearts and the hearts of those who will listen now and in the future. Help us, Lord, to learn the Christian attitude. Help us to be changed through your word. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen and amen. We saw last week in chapter 4 that uh, Paul was making a plea for purity, that we should be walking uh, in purity. And... Um, we're just going to read a couple of selected verses here, not taking much time to comment, but uh, chapter 4 of First Thessalonians, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God. So live clean, live pure. There was a young man who testified about how he was able to go to see Billy Graham one time. He was just a young fellow, about 12 or 13, uh, but he was just enjoyed uh, Billy Graham's ministry so much. And he was able, after Graham came off the altar, to stand in a place where he could see him. And Billy Graham came down and looked at the young man and gave these words to him. Young man, live clean, live clean, live clean. The young fellow never forgot it. That was what Billy Graham thought was the most important thing to share. When I went out to see Don Gossett, and I was uh, out on his board of directors, uh, he was a world-traveled evangelist, and I had a chance to pray with him and his wife, Joyce. We sat down, and he said, uh, Jerry, purity is power. And that became a book that he wrote, Don Gossett, Purity is Power. In any event, uh, live clean uh, is the message there. And then he goes on to say, we need to live in love in verse 9. Um, he says, uh, let's read verse 9 and through 12. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed you do so toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase more and more, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to work with your own hands as we commanded you that you may walk properly toward those who are outside, and that you may lack nothing. Very good and practical and very godly advice. And then we're going to pick up our message today with verse 13 as it leads into chapter 5. Uh, I want to mention to you, by the way, that Paul's work with the Thessalonian church, he was able to work with them only a short time, and then the uprising came because of the sharing of the gospel. The Jews got upset that the gospel was being preached to the Gentiles, and they created a ruckus, and he didn't have a chance to stay there very long. But the seeds that he did sow went deep, uh, so deep that Sam and I were looking, three weeks ago, Sam, we were 
sitting right where he is now, and we got on the Google and we checked out the churches in Thessalonica. Oh yeah, they're a Christian. In fact, one couple playing the guitar and sharing, they, they minister between Thessalonica and Florida, speak perfect English, and uh, there are churches to this day that are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul's work 2,000 years ago is still going on there and all over the world. Well, the first point we're going to talk about is be watchful. You and I should be watchful. Let's talk about this. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. See, they were concerned about the ones who had passed on. What happened to them? Where did they go? Will they be in heaven with us? Are we going to be there before them or after them? What happened to our loved ones? A question you and I would like to know as well. Where are the loved ones? Mama, Papa, whoever went on, where are they now? What are they doing? And so he goes on to say, verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So those who have died in the Lord are going to come back with the Lord Jesus when he returns for his church. And we go on, verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. So this is a word directly from Jesus, that uh, we are not going to see Jesus and be in heaven before those who already passed on. Pretty axiomatic, pretty... Uh, so they've already seen, they see right. the Lord first. That's right. Your, your beloved Poppy who passed on two years ago, he's up there right now with his New York Yankees hat probably, and he's rooting for Aaron Judge. I had a dream he knows, of him. He didn't have the New York Yankees hat on. He didn't have the... Oh, no. Okay. I guess... Uh, I mean, maybe the Lord says, check that at the gate. And we, we don't allow that up here. We don't want any division up there because those Red Sox get all upset about that. Anyway, those who have passed on in Christ uh, are not going to be there after us. They're there before us. They're with him already. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So this is the coming of the Lord. It's not his second coming because he does not come to the earth. He comes to the air over the earth. But he's coming with your poppy and my parents and others who are in Christ. And there's going to be a shout uh, from the Lord, no doubt. The voice also of an archangel. And the trumpet of God's going to sound. And those who are dead in Christ, those who passed on in Christ before us, will rise first. I like to think because they're in the ground probably, uh, they get a six foot head start, they come out of that ground first in their new resurrection bodies. And then what about those who are alive in their natural bodies, verse 17? Then we, sh th then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So those who are alive in their natural bodies and still here when the Lord comes for his church, uh, they'll be caught up together. They'll be snatched quickly, decisively, uh, and they'll be changed. They'll be metamorphosized, if you will. They'll be changed into their resurrection bodies. So if the Lord came right now, mom and dad are in the backyard, by the way. The remains are there in heaven, but they're in the backyard as far as the remains are concerned. And so the Lord comes right now, boom, they come out of the ground first. I'm changed into my resurrection body. We go up together to be with the Lord. Is that good news? Oh, you the bet best. it is. The best and it's news. called the rapture, and some say, well, I don't see the word rapture in the Bible. Well, if you want to read the Latin, how's your Latin? Read the Latin Vulgate Bible, you'll see the word is raptura. That's where it comes from. You don't want the word rapture? Then call it the violent catching away of the church. This is supposed to be comfort, and he says in verse 18, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And that leads into our first point today is be watchful. Be watchful because the Lord could come at any moment. But people have been waiting today. for them for 2,000 years. That's right. Well, 2,000 years seems like a long time, but the Bible doesn't also say that a day with the Lord it's is a as thousand a 1,000 years. years and a 1,000 years as a day. So it's been two days, right? So big deal, right? You have to remember, it's the kingdom of God is opposite of what we see. We have to see with our spirit. So when you hear these words, I know there's some people here thinking, it's a little out there. It's a little out there. Do they really believe that? You know, I believe in God, but do they really believe he's going to come? You've got to see through the eyes of faith. Ask God. You've got to put away all that stuff and thinking about what people think and all that. And just with faith. 
Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the first thing we're going to do with Christian attitude is we're going to be watchful because the Lord, as we just saw, is coming. Let's read verses 1 through 11. But concerning the times and the season, seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should, not, should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Amen. Powerful, powerful words. Love them. Love them. First one, concerning the times and the seasons, when is the Lord going to return? That's a question people ask. As the days seem to get darker, the question seems to be offered more and more. Uh, do you think he's going to come now? Uh, they see new advances in technology and computers and stuff, and they can see how we can see the whole world at one point. Uh, as I say, Sam and I could just get on the internet and within five seconds found churches in Thessalonica. Couldn't do that in Paul's time. Could the Lord be coming now? Could be any moment. But we don't know the times and the seasons. Uh, only the Lord knows that. And we don't... Uh, have to know the exact answer to that. He knows it. It's in his hands. But you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Uh, the day of the Lord's going to start when the Lord comes and takes his church out, known as the rapture. We go up to be with him in heaven. We'll be there for how many years? Seven years. And during those seven years, we're going to be having the judgment seat of Christ. Our rewards will be given out. And the earth is plunged into the period known as the tribulation time. The first three and a half years seem to be a false, quiet peace. Then suddenly one man becomes absolutely supreme throughout the whole world. John calls him the Antichrist. He then rules with a rod of iron and uh, it starts to persecute Israel and the rest of the world. The last three and a half years are the hardest uh, of that time. We're all up there in heaven and uh, I'm not sure we can see all of it, what's going on, but we're with the Lord. We're, we're serving him, loving him, and the earth is going through this purging process. At the end of that time, Revelation 19, we're coming back. Amen. Riding on white horses. I don't ride horses too well. I don't know about you, but I'll learn, I guess. And uh, so we're going to come back with him uh, at the Battle of Armageddon. Antichrist is defeated, etc. And then we enter the millennium, the thousand-year reign of peace. That's all so-called the day of the Lord. That whole time, because the day of the Lord means the Lord says, enough is enough. I'm taking over. Right now, it's the day of Satan. It's the day of flesh. But the Lord says, that suddenly I'm coming back. I'm in charge. So the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night when you least expect it. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now we're talking here about the time when he comes back for the second coming with us at the end of the tribulation. He's going to land on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split, and that's all in Scripture. You can study that on your own. And uh, with the Internet, it's so much easier to study prophecy and see what's going to be happening in the future. It's exciting. And, of course, where we're better to go than the Bible itself, right? That's the one that really gives us the answers. So, meanwhile, are we walking in light or are we walking in darkness? Right now it's about quarter to 12 on Sunday morning, and here in Albany it is light. Elsewhere it's dark. Certain parts of the world right now are in darkness. That's a picture of us spiritually. Right now if you're in Christ, you are in the light. For those who are not in Christ, spiritually speaking, they are in darkness. They just are in darkness. So he says, verse 4. 
But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So you're not in darkness because you have Christ. He is your light. And this day, the day that the Lord's going to return for his church, the day that the Lord's going to return uh, to establish the millennium and invite those who are in Christ to enter into that millennium, they are in the light. They should be ready for that day. We don't know the exact day and time, but I like the uh, Old Testament reference to Issachar. That tribe sensed the times in which they lived, spiritually speaking. They knew the times. You and I should have a general sense of the timing of the Lord, what he's trying to do. Lord, give me a sense of the time, not only of your return, but of what I'm supposed to be doing for you today. So we are sons of light, we're not sons of the darkness, we should walk in the light. Verse six, let's be busy. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So this is not a time to sleep. There's work to be done for the Lord. Now, when I retire, when I know, no, right now, today is the day to be serving the Lord. Doesn't mean you have to quit your day job, you don't quit your family, but Lord, how may I serve you today? And uh, we need to be sober, and that really means from the Greek, self-controlled. When you're drunk, you're not in self-control. When you're sober, you are. Lord, help me to be controlled and help me to be busy doing for you what you require. Verse seven. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. That's what the world is doing if they're not in Christ. Spiritually speaking, they're drunk, they're not working, they're not productive. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. So Paul here is giving the picture of the Roman soldier with his armor. And the armor of the Roman soldier was a breastplate. We've all seen pictures of it, or maybe movies of it. And the breastplate is the part that covers his heart, his chest. And uh, that is a picture really of the faith and love which protect us. Our faith and our love protect us from darkness, protect us from the devil, protect us from sin, and from the evil old nature within us. So we want that breastplate of righteousness, and that breastplate of faith and love. And the helmet, that's the part that protects the brain, right? You can lose parts of your body, and it's mighty uncomfortable, but lose your head, and the likelihood of living uh, is not very good. But plus, all the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart grow cold. So if we don't put on the helmet of uh, hope and salvation, the brain, what happens to people who have no hope? They get depressed, they end up mentally ill, and, you know, salvation, same thing, breastplate, you want to cover and protect that heart with faith and love, so we have to put on that breastplate. We literally have to put those things on to protect ourselves, because otherwise we will get attacked, and if we don't have faith and love, it attacks our heart, our body, our soul, our mind. Look around. Mental illness is growing. It's like never before the way it is. It's terrible. That's right, especially after COVID. Yeah. You make a very good point. But I thought once I'm born again that I have faith and love and righteousness. We need and the salvation. Lord. We all need the Lord. Yeah, we, we have it. We have it as far as our position in Christ. But practically speaking, you got to put it on. Got to put it on. You got to get up in the morning and you got to say, right now, I'm putting on. And all these words, by the way, for the armor are really references to Christ. I'm putting on faith in Christ. I'm putting on my love of Christ. I'm putting on the helmet of the salvation that I have in Christ. And there are those who actually, and I used to do this at times, uh, Ephesians 6 gives you a fuller picture of the armor. I'd get up there in front of the mirror and I'd say, I'm putting on the helmet of salvation. Jesus is my protection for my brain. I'm putting on the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit. Put on the armor of God. Go through that and realize that I am protected in Christ. You need to put that on daily. And uh, he goes on to say now in verse 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ah, but is the church going to go through the tribulation? You hear that teaching going on. I'll give you one verse that will knock that theory right into a cocked hat. And that's understand what is the revelation? What is the tribulation time? Revelation 6 tells us what the whole 
punishment of the tribulation period is about and see if you think the church ought to go through it. Revelation 6, verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Whose wrath? The wrath of Jesus. The, revela the tribulation is the wrath of Jesus. Is he going to put that on his children? Do you punish your children who are doing right? Of course not. The, the tribulation is to separate the wheat from the chaff, put people through the fire, put them through the hurricane, so to speak, to see who's going to have faith in Christ and who's going to be able to enter into the millennium. The church is in heaven. Now, there'll be those who have not heard the good news and they're going to come to Christ in the tribulation time. They may be martyred, they may be spared, but it's the wrath of Jesus on those who are rejecting him. And so here he tells us very clearly, Paul understands that God did not appoint us to wrath. And that means we're not going to have the wrath of the tribulation. We're not going to have the wrath of the lake of fire, hell, Gehenna. We will not have that. We are going to have instead salvation and all that that means. The word salvation means health, healing, prosperity, blessing, eternal life with Christ. And the salvation is always through our Lord Jesus Christ and no one else. And why is it through Jesus Christ? Because verse 10 says, Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Why Jesus Christ? Why not uh, uh, some other system? Why not Muhammad? Why not somebody else? Because nobody else died for our sins. Nobody else was qualified to die for our sins. Nobody else was sinless and perfect. Nobody else was God in the flesh. But Jesus Christ, he died for us. He provides salvation for us that whether we wake or sleep, we're going to live together with him. And so waking and sleeping doesn't mean working and not working. There it means when you're awake during the day and you're sleeping at night, uh, you are in Christ. And for those that have trouble sleeping at night, and you've got attacks at night. Some say the devil attacks you at night. Go to bed with a psalm on your, on your heart. Listen to it. Some listen to the scriptures all night long uh, under their pillow. Uh, but get your mind on Christ. And again, this is all about comfort. Verse 11. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So that's the first thing we do as believers. We are watchful. The Lord is coming. The second exhortation, it's a little harder to take, uh, is be respectful. Uh, our Lord, our leaders deserve it, or if they don't deserve it, they need it. Um, he's not talking about leaders in politics or school or home. He's talking really about leaders in the church, but it by extension applies to every area of leaders. We have leaders throughout. We have police officers. We have everybody who is in leadership position, and we should be respectful, not because they really deserve it in what they've done, but they deserve it because of the office that they hold, and that is important. That's important. I've I have noticing. preached that for over 25 years. That's right. You know, you may not like your boss. You may have seen things you didn't trust in life, but you honor, respect. If you don't want to be there, then find another job, right? But we still have to respect. Now, they abuse you. They're nasty to you. You've got to take it up. You know, you, there's things you do. We have that in the world that we can do things. Same with a parent. They're abusive. They're knocking you around, beating you up. You might have to, obviously, you have to leave. We get it. But we still... Uh, we, there's an honor and respect. I always told my kids, you still need to respect and honor that authority. I was always, because I was always afraid. Police, this and that. I wanted them to learn to respect and honor when I went out that door. I didn't know what was going to happen. They say a wrong word. One time we had to rescue one of my sons from the police office. <laughs> he was harassing the police officers. I was like, oh my gosh. I couldn't believe it. And they were really good. He was under the influence. And he... I don't even know what to say. He's it, was, not it was Schenectady. He wasn't really all that bad. He was on the front lawn of the police station. Fifteen officers saying, come on, take a piece of me. Come right on here. And these guys are... Thank like, God those police <laughs> officers didn't do anything. I, it was the grace of God. <laughs> Thank but, you, Schenectady police. <laughs> but, you know, he's, he's grown since then. But my point is, you know, I was always trying to teach them, and he was under the influence. He normally, I didn't think, would do that. But that's why we want to do that. We want to teach our children to honor and respect. Obviously... People take advantage of that, so I want to put that out there. But we have to know how to That's right. put this across. And it starts in the home. 
That it starts in the home because mother and dad are deserving of that respect by office that they hold, but also you'll be, you're learning how to respect other authority. Mm -hmm. You don't respect mom and dad, not going to respect the teachers, not going to respect the pastors, not going to respect the president, the governor, not going to respect the police officers. It has to be learned, and you learn it at home. Well, let's look at verses 12 and 13. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, but at peace among yourselves. Be at peace, Be among, at peace among yourselves. Yeah, so there are those who have been over us, not just in the church, pastors, elders, uh, etc., but also, uh, again, the home, and um, your, your teachers in school, uh, the uh, people at work, and uh, those in the political office. We urge you, brethren, they labor among you. They, they work among you. They're not over you, really, in God's eyes, but they're among you. And uh, they're over you in the Lord only as he ordains that position. And uh, they admonish you. They, they warn you. And again, he's talking mostly here about the, about the order of the church. He's telling the Thessalonians, listen to your pastors. Listen to those who are in eldership over you. And that's important. And, and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Uh, so you see, again, the, the work they're doing is important. And uh, Kelly and I uh, appreciate all kinds of professions, uh, but there is no profession, in my humble opinion, which is any more important than that of pastoring and ministering the gospel. Uh, there was one president of the United States who uh, was a clergyman before. He was a minister, a pastor, and he said, I descend the pulpit to become president of the United States. And he had it right. He was taking a step down from the august position of God's person in the pulpit to become president of the United States. Who was that person? Who was the pastor who became a president? Google it if you'd like. Check out Garfield, see what you come up with. Not, not the cat, but check out the president at Garfield. And he says, be at peace. Be at peace among yourselves. Stop your fighting. Stop your arguing. Shalom. You see the, the culture of that day, though? They, just, they respected the word of God. <laughs> they did. They did. All right. We're watchful as believers. We are respectful. We're also mindful about others and care for them. Let's look at verses 14 and 15. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. That's the gospel. Yeah, and verse 15... See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Oh, that's practical, isn't it? Wow. That really works. So good. Verse 14, now we exhort you, we, we really encourage you, brethren, warn those who are being unruly. Uh, unruly, what does that mean? They're being insubordinate and they're being idle. They're being insubordinate and they're being idle. So you have to warn them. That's right. Sometimes I've had to warn people and people have warned me when, you know, my walk in life. And um, when I warned, I said to Jerry, I warned them and I ran out the door. <laughs> Sometimes you have to give the message and they're not going to receive it, but you told them it and then you leave and you leave it up to the Lord. And guess what happens? I just told him this morning, boy, God is good. He is good. He takes that word and he chisels away their heart, chisels away their heart. We have to warn because someday we're going to be before the Lord, and we have to know, did we, did we tell them? Did we tell our family member? Did we talk to them about this? That's right. And if they don't listen to you, God's going to take care of it. And God spoke to me the other day about something. I've been working with an unruly case, and the Lord said, uh, relax, you've done your part. You've shared the word. Now I'm going to let future employers do the rest. This young person's going to have to have one failure after another until that person learns respect already has had four for four, canned four times in four jobs, and um, there are more employers just waiting to do their job. So the Lord said, you've done your part, relax, and move on to the next case. Unruly, insubordinate, God's going to deal with it. Now, there are those who are faint-hearted. What do you do with the faint-hearted? You comfort them. You comfort them. You don't go ahead and just lecture them. Now, buck up. Come on. Now it's going to work out. Come Knock on, off Bucky. this attitude. You know, etc. <laughs> <laughs> comfort the faint-hearted. Sit down and listen to them. You know one of the best things you can do with somebody who's faint-hearted? Zip your mouth. Zip your mouth. Just sit there and listen and They're just sad. be there. They're broken. Just be there. 
And then as the Lord gives us an encouraging word, give that word. But if they're faint-hearted, don't, don't abuse them. Uh, it's like a, like a surgeon with a broken bone. You have to set it and set it gently. Uh, uphold the weak. Oh, there are, what does it mean to be weak? It could be weak in any area, physically, emotionally, financially, spiritually. Uh, they need someone to protect them. We, uh, we had to take another rescue case in with a dog uh, three weeks ago. And, uh, little Tell miss, them about her, though, how just, well she's just, doing. She's doing well, little Miss Candy, 11 years old and uh, frail, and her owner has, is very old and he's blind, can't take her. And so um, there was a plea to please, please take this little Yorkie, and we did. And um, so we didn't try to say, come on, Candy, get out there and walk with the other dogs. We had to gently work with her, and she's thriving. She's beginning to prosper, we're beginning to bless. We don't know if she can see very well at this point, or if at all, we're just trying to figure out exactly how to minister to her. Yeah, I was wondering her. why she's like a piranha when I give her food, right? Then I realized, put the food out, and she's like this. Yeah. So yeah, we don't think her vision's that good either. Yeah. But we're gonna just continue to minister to her and do what we can with them. Uh, the weak, other dogs are strong, but uh, this one's weak, so we just continue to work with her and she is blossoming, she is uh, progressing. And then be patient with all. Oh, that's hard. Patient with everybody. And that, it takes a lifetime to do that. But when you pray for patience, God's gonna give you opportunities to learn to be patient and uh, do, do pray for it. Some say don't pray for it, but always pray for God's best. Lord, help me to be patient. And there are many ways you can approach that. I do it through prayer. One of the things that I do in prayer is to say, Lord, uh, I think this person's a jerk, but I need to see this person through your eyes. Change my heart, Lord. Change my heart. Change, Change my me. Heart. Greatest book on that subject, Evelyn Christensen's book, Lord, Change Me. She was impa impatient with her husband and her kids. They were the worst. Lord, change me. God began to change her. The husband began to change. The kids began to change. And uh, that's sowing and reaping and, and uh, giving and taking. And, uh, it's all about forgiveness, right. reconciliation, love. One showing. of the most powerful prayers I can offer is, Lord, help me to see that person through your eyes. Do you see that person as a worthless jerk the way I do? I don't think so. I think you see that that person is worth dying for. Help me, Lord, to have your heart. Help me to see that person through your eyes and to feel the same way about that person. You, you pray that and see what happens. Change me, Lord. Change me. Verse 15, see that no one renders evil for evil. Oh, isn't that just a reaction? Somebody lets you have it, you wanna just let that person have it, don't you? It doesn't, you don't have to say to somebody now, when they begin to speak bad against you, you speak bad against them. They begin to take a swing at you, you take a swing at them. You don't need to teach that. That's natural. That is devilish. That's old nature. It's a sin nature. That's right. And so we need to learn how to not give evil for evil, but always pursue what is good for yourselves and for all. That's the answer. Lord, I'm being abused by this person. I'm being badly treated. I want to do the same thing to them. I've got five ways in which I can really do them in, but I want to do good for them and for all and for your name. Show me how to bless that person. Show me how to bless that individual. And Jesus told you how to do it. Pray for your enemies. Do good for those who despitefully use you. And Lord, help me to love them in Jesus' name. Well, we need to be thankful is our fourth point. Oh, we need to be thankful because thanksgiving blesses everyone. Let's look at verse 16 to 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. But how can I rejoice about certain things that are going on? Well, you can't rejoice about those things. Your rejoicing is not in those things, it's in the Lord. He's always the same, isn't he? So we shouldn't be saying, well, well, I'm rejoicing in Thanksgiving for a hurricane or for cancer. No, that, that's ridiculous. Uh, we can say, Lord, through the hurricane or the cancer, teach me what I need to learn through that experience. But I'm not rejoicing in those things. Nor am I rejoicing in the fact that I just got a raise or that I just got a brand new car or this or that. No, I'm not rejoicing in that. I'm still rejoicing in the Lord. I can be happy about good things even unhappy about bad things. But your rejoicing is always in the Lord and he's always the same. He's not up and down. 
like a Ferris wheel or like, like something else. I'm rejoicing in you, Lord. Keep your eyes on him. Verse 17, pray without ceasing. Does that mean I can't eat and sleep and talk because I'm busy praying all the time? No, it just means you're always thinking about the Lord. And you're pray always... about all things and everything. That's right. Pray without ceasing. And then give thanks for the good things. Sure. Give thanks for the bad things. Yeah. About that hurricane and cancer, I give thanks that, Lord, you're going to show your glory. You're going to teach me lessons. I'm going to grow in faith through this experience. And others are going to watch, and they're going to see that you are working through me to bless them and draw them as well. And, Lord, we're going to be looking to you to do good things through this experience. So I'm giving thanks for it because it's coming from you and through you. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So whatever the situation is, you thank God for it. And uh, we have to knock off the complaining. It's so easy to complain. But uh, my mother used to say, don't complain. Be careful lest a fate worse than this befall you. It could get worse. It could get worse. I said to my father when I was much younger, I hate the weather in Albany. It's so cold, it's tough weather. Spring is only one day and fall is two days and the rest is all summer and winter. I hate it. He said, oh, it could be a whole lot worse, son. You'd be, be grateful. No place is worse than this, Albany. So I got into the United States Army. Yep. When you hear what Fir happened. First tour of duty, Fairbanks, Alaska. Oh, arrived in March, 20 below zero. Uh, and the, the coldest day of the year it was, was uh, in January of the following year, minus 70 degrees. Can you imagine? Raw I've been temperature. In, I've been in minus 24, and it's, you can't even go out. I can't imagine. You dress with your warmest clothes in Fairbanks, Alaska on a typical winter day and you have a little breakdown in your car, you got to get out and fix it. Guess how long you can live with your warmest gear on a typical day in Fairbanks? 15 minutes. Imagine That's it. That. Imagine that. That's it. How about, how about starting your car? No problem. Your car is never turned off. When you go to the grocery store, you let it run. You let it run. And at night you got trickle heaters, etc. That's And then the summertime, oh my golly. Uh, we used to call, we used to have mosquitoes down here. We call them mosquitoes up there. Huge. Of course, you like tomatoes. They're, they're this big. They're wonderful. But that was it. Oh, I couldn't stand this cold. Tell Dad's, Dad's words. <laughs> Be careful lest a fate worse than this befall you. Where do you hear I this? I didn't see that 70 degree day uh, in Fairbanks. Because I was in Seattle, Washington, getting ready to go to Vietnam in 1969 in the height of the war. It wasn't 70 degrees below zero. Mm -hmm. It wasn't 70 above. It was like 105 degrees, and the ground fire was light to medium, and the rockets were, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. Tell them about you're not supposed to take your helmet off. <laughs> <laughs> you said, I've been through enough. I don't care. Oh, and yeah. he slept without his helmet. Everybody else sleep with the helmet. He took the helmet off and said, I'm sleep sleeping. with the flak jackets <laughs> and the helmet because you're being bombed every night. The rockets, like they have over in, in Ukraine. <laughs> It brings back memories of what I did every night for six months. It's, I said, hey, if I go, I go. I wasn't a believer then. Um, but I'll tell you, I was really good at putting my boots on. I knew how to put your boots You know how you put your boots on in Vietnam? Uh, you take the boot, you lift it upside down, you shake it, you tap it, you tap the sides, and then fearfully, oh. you put your hand in there and see who's in there, and then pull, pull your hand out. Oh, there's nobody there. The boot goes on. Seriously, that's how... It could be worse, guys. No matter what's going on, it could be worse. Count it all joy. Now, verse 19 talks about, let's be attentive. Let's pay attention because God is speaking. And verses 19 to 21. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. How do you quench the spirit? The Holy Spirit, how do you quench him? One simple word, sin. Sin will quench the Holy Spirit. Sin of any sort. In your thoughts, in your actions, your reactions, whatever, don't quench the Holy Spirit. He's trying to work through you to develop the life of Christ in you. Don't block him. Do not despise prophecies. Are prophecies still for today? Yes. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul talked about it in Ephesians 4. The office of prophet is still there. Can anybody prophesy? I believe yes. Mm -hmm. Anybody can be open. Otherwise, he would not say, despise, don't despise it. It's not just for the chosen few. You can prophesy, 
Ask the Lord to reveal to you. Now, prophecy is twofold. Telling the future. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, thus and such will happen. We know that. But you know, that's foretelling, F-O-R-E, telling. There's also forth, F-O-R-T-H, telling. Proclaiming the word. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's forth telling the word. That's also prophecy. Don't despise it from whatever source. Test all things. Hold fast what's good. Thus saith the Lord God to this congregation, you will do so and so and so and so and so and so. Do you have to believe that? No, you test it first. You test it, especially with the elders and those in authority. Test it in your own spirit. We used to have a man that thought he had a gift of prophecy and he'd stand up and one day he rebuked us like you cannot believe. Afterwards I thought, whoa, and I talked to the elders and I said, do you bear witness to that? And they said, absolutely not. God was not displeased with this church and he was not rebuking and that man was wrong. I went over to him and I said, the elders and I have met, we do not bear witness to what you have said. I'm going to give you one week to go home and pray about what you just said. And then you decide. If you still stand by it, then you come back and we'll have to deal with how we're going to handle it. Or you realize you were wrong and you apologize. Next week he came back and he apologized, but I realized he wasn't sincere. His heart was not in it. He went on to stay a little bit longer, and he was problem, and then he finally left. And then he went to other churches, and he began to rebuke them and their pastors. He'd come back once or twice a year here, and he would talk, he'd rebuke our people in private. And I was just about to say, you cannot come back into this church anymore. This went on for like 10 years. And the Lord said, hold back, I'm going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what he did, but the guy never came back yeah, again. never came back again. But we, we didn't just accept what he said, we tested it. Now, there have been those who've had prophecies and we've He would always them. go to somebody new, too. Always somebody new. <laughs> always go after them. All right, verse 22 to 28. Be faithful because consistency is vital for holiness. Verses 22 to the end. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Abstain from every form of evil, no matter what it is, just don't go there. Verse 23, now may the, this is a wonderful uh, benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you, set you apart unto him as holy and sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body, that's all of you, be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he returns in the rapture, or he comes to take you home, may you be in Christ. If you sin, you confess your sins, and you get that blood of Christ cleansing you from that sin. He who calls you is faithful, and also he will do it. He's going to keep you clean. He's going to keep you in Christ. Amen. You're not going to lose your salvation. You just stay close to the Lord. And if you don't, the Holy Spirit's going to be on you like you can't believe. So you stay faithful. Brethren, pray for us. Paul was never embarrassed to say pray for me. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss and whatever that might mean in every different congregations. And um, J.B. Phillips had a, a, a transliteration of the Bible, which I enjoyed, being British. Can you imagine a, a British writer translating that uh, and the British thinking kiss? So he finally said, greet one another with a hearty handshake all around. <laughs> so, <laughs> the Pentecostals give that hug. If they're not married, the head is way over there. But whatever it is, let it be genuine. Let it be sincere. Let it be holy and unto the Lord. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. Pass it around to the different house churches and the great grace, God's undeserved, unmerited favor, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, so be it. Amen and amen. Great, great epistle. Love Paul and his very practical admonitions. Proper attitude determines proper outcome. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this precious word that we heard today. Help us all to be changed by it, to remember it, to apply it to our lives, and to give it out to others. Lord, help us to walk in mercy, truth, forgiveness, reconciliation. Help us to be one who brings, us, brings others together, builds bridges, Lord, not to break them. We ask these things, Lord, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen and amen. Yes.
Resting by this moment your needs to supply Reach out